Hi, welcome everyone to this Upper Valley Land Trust presentation of Writing the Land Poetry. I'm Lise McLaughlin from the Writing the Land Project, and I'm hosting with Allison Marcioni from Upper Valley Land Trust. This presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to suggest that you use the speaker view in Zoom so that you can get a good view of the poet's reading and the pictures of their lands behind them. Secondly, I'll ask you to use chat for questions because in the end, we'll have time to read them to the poets. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Allison Marcioni from Upper Valley Land Trust. Allison is from central Vermont where she first found her love of the outdoors in the fields and forests around her family home. Allison has been the programs director at the Upper Valley Land Trust for the last four years. And before that, she was a land steward at Upper Valley Land Trust for two years. She earned her bachelor's degree in environmental science from Wells College and her master's in environmental science and land management from Sacred Heart University. Please help me welcome our Upper Valley Land Trust host, Allison Marcioni. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us on this cold November day to hear a little poetry. Um, I wanted to give a brief explanation of why UVLT chose to be a part of the Writing the Land project, because I know it isn't always clear at first for some people what the connection between land trusts and poetry might be. So when UVLT was approached to be a part of this project, we were at the beginning of the pandemic and we thought that this would be an interesting and creative way of examining and expressing the connections between people and the natural world. Especially as we were starting to see the significance of access to the outdoors, um, how that was going to play into people's well-being during the pandemic. We also believe that the land can inspire all kinds of art, including music and poetry and literature. And we wanted to foster that connection and share it with all of you. Um, so UVLT is pleased to participate in the Writing the Land project because it supports both poets and land conservation and invites people into new aspects of a place through the poetry. So um, I think that's enough of me talking and I'm ready to hear some poetry. Great. So thanks so much for welcoming us here today. Um, again, I'm Lise McLaughlin and I'm here with Writing the Land Poets, Hope Jordan, Christopher Locke and Jessica Purdy. Each of these poets wrote an Upper Valley Land Trust special protected place. So today we'll get to hear some of the poetry inspired by these lands. Uh, poetry created through the Writing the Land project is designed to support land trusts. Uh, and we're very grateful for the opportunity to help Upper Valley protect these very special lands and hope that you'll take advantage of the project to help them too. Uh, we've created an anthology with a chapter for each of 11 land trusts in New England with poems, trail maps, pictures, and other information about how land trusts uh, such as Upper Valley can serve special places and you can purchase this anthology directly from the land trust as a way to support their mission and to share your love of land with others. Uh, we hope we'll, you will enjoy reading it in winter. And now on to the poetry. Our first poet is Jessica Purdy. Jessica holds an MFA in creative writing from Emerson College. Her books, Starland and Sleep in a Strange House, were both released by Nix's Mate Books. Jessica wrote an Upper Valley land called The Dismal, and she also wrote an agrarian trust farm called Vernon Farm. Welcome, Jessica Purdy. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here in this beautiful day. It's... Um, it's fun to get together at any time of day on Zoom, I think, um, but it's nice that you took the time to, to join us today. Um, so I'm gonna start with my dismal poems and then uh, move on to the agrarian poems. Um, the dismal is, is kind of funny the way it's named. Uh, it's not dismal at all there. It's very beautiful. Uh, the day we went, it was um, quite warm here in Exeter where I live. And we thought, oh, well, we'll bring a few extra layers. 
in case. And upon arrival in Hanover, it started pouring and thundering and got really, really cold, like immediately as soon as we got there. So we had to put on all these extra layers. But anyway, um, that's kind of the way it is when you go outside, you have to be prepared, right? So um, this first one is called At the Dismal at Pressy Brook Conservation Land. Annoyance in spring, gnats in my eyes, forgetting bug spray and sunglasses, loud cars, packs of motorcycles needing attention, popping their exhaust, exhaustion, not getting in position to film the eagle before it flies away, people who leave the toilet seat up, being awakened by noise, ticks, anything sticky on the floor, ants on the floor, hot flashes. All this could be solved with a waterfall in the dismal at Pressy Brook. Arriving at the trail, our long awaited destination, it starts downpouring. The slow sizzle like hamburger in a hot pan, the crunch of old twigs underfoot, a fallen tree dips its fingers in, combs the running water, a sieve, a spider web between branches. I consider how the dead tree's intrusion ruins the waterfall's perfection, but then see how its branches are like this woman's body, eager to rest, trailing her fingers, letting the water's silk run, asking so little from her world. I cannot make the waterfall run, but I can dip my fingers in. Mossy stones, emerald green pillows soft against the cheek of silk brown water. What if the tree grasped the boulder in its hand and held it in its palm, grew together as the land shifted? How much blood root can blossom in two weeks. The dye can color our clothes, our blankets. What if we didn't have to worry that the water would never stop running, falling, that the sound would never end, leave us bereft? Even the ticks, those hangers on, can be seen, picked off. Layers of clothing can be put on in chill, shed in heat. The air's changing temperature, rapid as mountain storms. <clears throat> we can be stopped by the ticking of rain falling in vernal pools. A big black dog crashing out from the underbrush looks us in the eye, stops moving, then charges back down the trail, its red collar flashing brightly like a beacon home. Um, so this next one is called Having Visited. And it sort of leads directly from, from the poem I just read. Having visited, I want to go back to the dismal to see what has happened since I left it last. Did they take away the tree that fell across the waterfall like a woman fainting in a silent film? The back of her hand across her forehead her fingers trailing in the spill. Water striders walking on the surface like miracles. The logger who came to take her away. Did he have wide hands, thick fingers? Did the dog who emerged from the brush find its owner? Did the car with the windows down get soaked with rain? What flowers bloom there now? Daisies, Queen Anne's lace? What vines have crept up the trunks of trees to choke them? Is it called bittersweet? They reach for the sun with the tips of their leaves. I want to smell the air there after it rains, to have heard thunder and run to the edge of the water on a cushion of needles. I want to see the boulder held in the palm of the tree's roots, hear the brief calls of birds I can't name, hear the water as it glides over the rocks, slippery with moss, green as good health and soft as a kiss. 
I want to go again with my husband and we'll strip off our clothes, shake the ticks off, share some water and leave our review of the destination hanging private in the air there. No question, we found our way in and we'll find our way back out. I want to be grateful. I don't know what it's like. I want to be grateful. I don't know what it's like to have never been here, to have loved like that. And this next one is the last one on the dismal. It's called trail map study. You don't have to know what the moss is named or know how many boards it took to make the bridge. You don't have to know which book to open or where to find the light of your curiosity. If only there were a way to portal yourself to the woods when you need them, leave behind those who would, who would try to stop your finding out, try to discourage your study of leaves. What shade of green, pattern of veins, what pink flower buds that you might want to make someone feel better by finding medicinal properties in the wildflowers. That the home you have found here in New Hampshire is the first place you are, you are learning to breathe. You don't need a manual for this kind of living. Um, thanks for listening to those. Um, and then I'm going to read the three poems that I wrote for the Vernon family farm. And that is a farm that is in Newfields, which is the next town pretty much, yeah, the next town over from, from Exeter where I live. Um, so I can go there anytime very easily. Chickens. I come to the farm in the morning. It's April and trees are just budding, turning into leaves that will green all summer and then go out like sunsets in autumn. I can walk freely past the store and into the short grass pasture. The farm hand tells me are too small for grazing yet. When the chicks get big enough, they can roam, eating and laying eggs, serving as fresh food for people like me who are sad but glad to see how clean and healthy they seem. Their white puff bodies kept warm in the cold, cool in the heat. On the pristine dirt floor, they eat, sleep, perch, preen. Pink skin, feathers coming in. They sound like water falling in open air. I can smell the heated breath of their climate controlled shelter. The grown chickens gossip and huddle, notice me. All around me, wildlife waits for no one. Reliant on themselves, morning doves, who in the old maples sing their instincts to the air. Um, okay, so then this next one is called Cows at Vernon Family Farm. Cows chuff the hay so quietly, I can hear the morning dove coo. When I was a child, I learned to imitate their call. I liked to think I heard their call in response. Next to the berm of compost, piled wood, split trees. The work of the farmer is evident, mud patterned with tractor tracks. Dandelions spring up in the ruts. I'm introduced to Maeve and Maple. They are being raised for milk. Two Jersey heifers, the softest black eyes and lashes like feathered fans. Clover and dock, black and white Wagyu Holsteins. Dark brown dandelion will be for meat. Did the farmer's children name them? They trundle by, little girls guided in their father's hand. I imagined myself as a child then, with little need of names, whirling in my rubber boots, watching my skirt rise in a circle around me, my soles printed in the mud after rain. And this last one is called Counting Sheep. Seven lambs, four sheep, 
and one llama. The llama rubs her face on the hay. The electric fence ticks. A reminder, don't touch. The lambs sleep, seem to smile into the sun. One rests its white hoof on the back of a black one. The sheep burp and ma. One of the lambs is sick. Somewhere a little girl pockets little plastic farm animals from a church playroom. When her mother finds her with them, she makes her give them back. She hadn't known it was wrong to take what didn't belong to her, only wanted to keep the feel of the plastic pig's smooth side, the sheep's rough white fur, the horse's brown flank, and play with them a little longer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that touching poetry. And I think the picture behind you is from the dismal. And uh, so is the one behind me by photographer uh, Doug Brown. It's a beautiful place, not dismal. Um, our next hope, poet is Hope Jordan, who wrote Upper Valleys Up on Hill. Hope uh, grew up in Chittenango, New York, holds a dual BA from Syracuse and an MFA from UMass Boston. She lives in New Hampshire, where she was the state's first official poetry slam master. Her chapbook is The Day She Decided to Feed Crows. Welcome, Hope Jordan. Thank you. Jessica, that was beautiful. Um, I was hoping that Zoom had maybe added a reaction that was like finger snapping, but I couldn't find one. Um, and I love the rhyme of intrusion and perfection. Like that was really lovely. So thanks. And thanks to um, Lise for including me in this anthology and for Allison um, providing this space and um, all the good work land trusts do. So I'm going to read three poems from Up on the Land, or Up on the Hill, I'm sorry, and then uh, a little smattering of other poems. I'm kind of obsessed with, um, like a lot of people, I think, I'm obsessed with um, humans and the natural world coming into connection with each other. The first one is called Father's Day 2021. Oh, and yeah, this is the land behind me. I don't know who the photographer was. Maybe uh, Liz can share that, but Father's Day 2021. Rows of corn whiffle in the heated breeze remind me of the muck workers you got to know summer times when you ran the register at my uncle's store on the Lake Road corner. Those men who spent the night on our couches and floors here, the Mylar balloon made its pilgrimage for who knows how many miles, carried by hot air, collapsed at the base of corn stalks, a bright red and white, congratulations, Father's Day. The old wooden gate rots alongside the road. The new one is shiny metal and closed. My next poem is Unoccupied. Unoccupied, but signs of habitation, cultivated rows of corn, just a giant grass and meadows upon meadows. My first Eastern kingbird shakes his tyrant head, tyrant flycatcher, fire engine, tie, father. Here shadows occupy outbuildings. Here the champion beech tree contains microclimates. A beech nut clunks to the ground, green and hard, high on nitrogen, invasives tendril into the path. Beneath the blue and white sky, a base of ferns lifts daisies, purple clover, black-eyed Susans, all gazing up and into the sun. <laughs> um, and this is, Eye socket pond midsummer, I as in E Y E. Um, it's easy for me, I can look at the text. 
I socket pond midsummer where milkweed blossoms curl in clusters, pink confections served on leaves shaped like platters. First the sound of a bullfrog, then another, then another, a mid-year, midday call and response. Here is where the earth turns. Right here, we are suspended between all that was and all that will be. Here the father is still alive, still going up the hill to hay the meadow, to plow the field, to harvest the forest. Here is an old spider web strung between stalks, standing timber. One of the um, things I enjoyed about this project was reading some of the history of the land. And so that last poem um, has a little nod to that, that story, um, which, which feels important to me. Um, okay, so a few more poems. Um, this one is called At the Confluence. And this is referring to the Kentuckook and Merrimack Rivers. Trucks rumble across Route 4, where rivers come together. Water detonates when a boy jumps off the railroad bridge. There are no significant rivers in the province of Kenya, where Jibril lived half his life in refugee camps. An empty bean can rolls on a surface pocked by raindrops. Jibril swam to the rescue. Grass beside the path, spikes dry and lavender, freshwater clamshells stacked like cemetery stones. The river curls in its socket, shallowing leaves that roil and tumble into next year's mud. The river reflects an older sky, blueberries, the colors of rocks. Insects percolate, summer subsides. They closed the flow to find their bodies. Women mourning wore hijabs in the humid sun. Okay. This one is called Trees at the Curve in the Road. And if you hear a lot of repetition, that's because it's a pantoum. Trees at the curve in the road. From whip thin sapling, layer by cellulose layer, wood thickens to stone or what feels like stone. Minerals, light, the variable magic of weather. Root threads soak up rain, grain by grain. Wood thickens to stone or what feels like stone. Feels like concrete to my dad in the Mustang. Root threads soak up rain, grain by grain. His car bounced, wrapped around the tree. Feels like concrete to my dad in the Mustang. Trees use fungal webs to speak underground. His car bounced, wrapped around the tree. What did he hear as he lay comatose for 13 years? Trees use fungal webs to speak underground. From whip thin sapling, layer by cellulose layer. What did he hear as he lay comatose for 13 years? Minerals, light, the variable magic of weather. Um, this is one of my very favorite poems. It's called Ode to a Luna. And it's after a poem by Peter Balakian. Um, I forget what his poem's called. It's Ode to, it's the name of a musical instrument that I can't remember. But this is Ode to a Luna after Peter Balakian. It's not trash I see, walking west along the road behind my house. It's just neon green light. And then it coalesces into a feeler, larval, Look down and there you are, silk wrapped, your body drummed inside the dusk. But how did you rise in afternoon, mid-June, night moth, voiceless, eye spots blind? So whenever I grieve the defeat of the forest, you and your cocoon subside to sleep in the leaf litter while blue light expands above the river in December. Somehow I know the texture, the sycamore of your overwinter, and the way you shake your numb wings awake. 
rattle of cans, dry asphalt, roadside weeds, daylight arrives like suffering coming into relief. Bless the echo locators, the oil birds and swiftlets. Bless even the bats who'd shred your hindwing jades and sages so we can witness the night dances, how you troll spring currents for a mate. So we witness the end and the beginning as you irradiate the darkness. Okay, uh, this is called Plagues We Have Known. A shield bug rides my shoulder to the kitchen. Amphibians season the air with song. I wash curtains. Blood swirls in the dog's water dish. Dead flies rest in the casserole. Eagles scream in the thermals. Snow falls hard. Flows float downstream. The wood stove overheats. Neighbors poison the peepers that keep them awake. Hail, the size of golf balls, deadfall and flood, a tightening. Something has been eating the tomato plants. River still too cold for it won't go away. Ice clamps down on the river. In bed, I turn to you. Okay. Um, this is another rather strange, very sciencey um, poem of mine. It's about vitamin D. <laughs> um, I'm calling it Sunshine Vitamin. Um, and I'm thankful to all the journals that these are all actually published um, somewhere out there in the world. Sunshine Vitamin. The trick they say is to stay till you're just about halfway to burning, outlast the oblique angles of winter. You've shunned the sun for months on end. You tend to make up for lost time, belly up swaths of skin and invite ultraviolet rays. in, respins itself into cholesiferol in the liver, gold, beef liver, egg yolks, white folks, family tree, and vitamin D is summoned from the kidneys, pale, could be paler, northern, not quite polar, provisioned anew with calcium, the revved skeleton. I'm just gonna read one final poem. And um, this is called Aftermarket Basket. Um, the photographer of this beautiful photo behind me is Doug Brown, if I haven't already said that. Okay, um, after Aftermarket Basket. Hard stop on the on-ramp, a beaver, comical on land as it isn't in the river humping across concrete from one side to another, striking out for new territory as they have forever, but for the past half century, the new territory's been four lanes of I-93. In our cars, we freeze. Go back to your pond, I shout in my head, paddle-tailed, dark-fingered creature, no place for you beyond that road. So even if it's crowded, go back to your pond. And the beaver stops, turns around, goes back the way it came. The car in front slowly gears up and we get on our 70 mile per hour way to wherever we're going. My evening of pasta salad, my night of visitations. Thank you very much. Great, thank you Hope uh, for those wonderful poems. Our next poet is Christopher Locke, who wrote True's Legends. Christopher Locke is the author of 12 books and chapbooks. His new book of poems, Music for Ghosts, from New York Quarterly Books, and his memoir, Without Saints, from Black Lawrence Press, 
are both due out in 2022. He teaches creative writing at North Country Community College in the Adirondacks and can be reached at chrispylock at hotmail.com. Welcome, Christopher Locke. Thanks so much, Lise. Uh, and uh, thank you um, to, to my co-conspirators, uh, Hope and Jessica, for their gorgeous uh, poems, really wonderful. Um, and thanks to Lisa and Allison for making this happen. Um, it's just a fantastic um, organization and it's, I'm just so, I feel really grateful to be a part of it. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Um, I wanna read a couple poems, two poems that I wrote for True's Ledge uh, and then a few other ones that really don't have anything to do with that, uh, but that's okay. I was really drawn to True's Ledge to be honest because of its name. I was really fascinated by that. Um, you know, I assumed that it was probably had something to do with someone's last name, but I, I like to think about it more um, that it maybe it was a little bit different. You know, I was really intrigued by it. Um, and so uh, the first time that I went there, it was really uh, terrible weather. It was gross. It was cold. It was November. Um, no one was around. Uh, it looked just desolate. And while we talked about dismal, it really was. Um, but uh, it pulled me in and, and, and it, is, it is gorgeous unto itself. And, and what I hope that you see with, with my writing, I, I guess I'm really, as a poet, am intrigued about that tension that exists between beauty and loss and, and joy and suffering. It's like my poems are more like Venn diagrams where I'm really intrigued by the disparate, the disparate ideas that come together and I look at the center and I try to find a connection between all of that. Um, so the first poem is uh, True's Ledge and I'll read that now. Its name incites hope, a chance to lift this year's shadow, but your dress shoes nearly falter, the trail shattered in oak leaves, November air so raw, even the saplings bow inconsolable. We stand at the rim, a gorge perfect for young love to fling itself over after nobody understands. And I smile at the pageantry, thankful I've forgotten such claims. I manage my way down, careful in my footing as I shake rainwater from young pine, prickling my neck and my hair. I discover a white sluice of roaring channeled between rocks, unending mist rising like prayer until I spy you above, looking down over what is left, both truth and memory between us and every landscape we've left behind. Uh, the photo behind me is uh, of True's Lights that I took when I was there the first time. Um, and the second poem is uh, called A Return. And um, I'm not sure if it was actually written because of the return or it actually happened while I was there the first time, but uh, that's fine. Um, A Return. Wind falters, pushes around the immovable as I busy the shoreline with quick steps, pebbles spitting underfoot. I avoid puddles and leap the scribbled runoff a cardinal speaks up, his deep slur, a confession to nothing, until his mate calls back, ruffles a bow in her everyday brown. They crisscross ahead of me, darting between sunlight, punching holes through the mist, the male's red coat so electric, you'd believe his song was written in blood. Uh, so, um, I think all of us have a uh, pandemic poem, whether we've written it or not. Um, I've written a few, and there's a few that I haven't. Um, I think it'll be easier to read one that I've written. Um, so, this is called Allegory. And it was from that time, which actually, before I read it, you know, the early days of the pandemic, you know, I actually thought then, I was like, you know what, I think we might look back at you know, it was March and April, I said, we'll look back at these as the good old days in some ways of the pandemic. And it really is difficult to have been right about that. Um, but this is from April 14th, 2020 allegory. A blackbird's trapped inside my bedroom, 
popping the bright window like a child's gloved hand. Golden eyes eerie with pupils, all of him nerve wracked and furiously mute. I want what he wants. So I bend and creep to the other window, grit tooth and pillow shielded, alive with Hitchcockian terrors I still imagine, even at this age. I fumble with the sash, look over my shoulder at another dry flourish, his desire heated to almost a reckoning, and I duck and weave and grimace until the frame gapes and he funnels like chimney smoke up into all that blue. But I never think to ask, where did he come from? And how did he choose the silence of this house, this captive place where we still dream as lost as those wings? And, you know, I figured I'd go for the trifecta and do another bird poem, you know, just because uh, I love birds. I really do. I, and I will never apologize for that. Um, so this one um, is called Counting, and I wrote it for my oldest daughter, Grace. My daughter, Grace, has a weakness for crows, points to one hopping the lid of the cafe dumpster, its shoulders oiled black as Elvis's pomp. And when we drive home, two crows tightrope the highway's yellow line, tap a squirrel pressed dry as a flower. Even as I speed past, they are fearless, pompous struts like federal judges before they sentence you to life. I will release my crows on an unsuspecting world, and they will do my bidding, Grace says. And I laugh. Imagine a wide cape of darkening sky as they fan out behind her in a staccato of barks and cries. Home, the car ticks in the driveway as I stand in the yard, spy three adjourned in a sugar maple, silent, disapproving, their languorous stares unsure if they've noticed my face before. Grace startles me from behind, places a silver necklace in my hand, Leave it on the stump, she says, so they'll know it's theirs. And when I look back up, there are now four. Uh, all right, so the last poem I'm going to read um, is about meals, food, um, something, uh, well, we all can relate to. But uh, you know, I, through college, high school, um, even after I've always worked in restaurants, found some way to be a part of it, either through in the kitchen, the front of the house, back of the house. Um, and uh, this is sort of a chrono, like, uh, well, as I said, it, it is an autobiography of my relationship. Um, so uh, autobiography of the table in the kitchen. There have been meals I've loathed and meals I've despised. Most recent, a rubbered patty oozing beneath its own greased shambles at a truck stop in Buffalo. The steam of plate clatter and diesel smoke, the only things divine. Meals eaten in silence when I was seven and the air between my parents suffocated the table, doom's easy smolder ready to fill our lives with smoke. Meals joyous at drive-ins, slicked in ketchup and glazed napkins. Meals of befuddlement slung mornings after childhood sleepovers. Words like bagel and omelet, birthing a new lexicon to mouthwater. Meals of out, out, wooden spoon cracking the pot's rim as children scattered from the kitchen, giggling snipes. Meals of despair before college, one room tenement as I jawed microwave burritos, stoned in my conviction, the mattress bloomed a Rorschach of clues. Meals of first dates palpitated by wicker Chianti and the shedding of garments, laughing about too much garlic as the sheets roiled in our new hunger. Meals tilled from farmer's markets and roadside stands, Swiss chard, a study in color and plumage, waxy peppers shined like the tongues of small fires. Solo meals of comfort after personal disasters, the counter serving as respite for the maligned. 
Meals of regret and meals of plenty, meals of family faces ensconced around a tablecloth saved crisp just for meals like that. And meals with you, simple across the table all those years of what we've said and what we couldn't. Meals best enjoyed with our eyes instead of our stomachs. Meals when we couldn't fill our mouths fast enough. The meal we had at a bustin kitchen table in our new apartment 25 years ago, surprising you first with purple iris, bottle of Cote du Rhone, hollowed dry, the way you stared at me and me at your working mouth, your hair swooning against your collarbones with a rhythm I had grown to love, and me finally putting down the fork and the knife and lifting the napkin from my lap and coming over to you and raising us up to the many tooth stars and all their crying out. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Christopher, for those great poems. Uh, all the poets in the book have volunteered their time to help transcribe the voices that they hear in the land and to help Upper Valley conserve these special places. So now it's time for the Q&A. Uh, so if you want to, you can unmute and ask questions. Um, or you, if you don't want to be on the video, uh, you can just type them into the chat. So anybody who would like to ask a question can go ahead. And while we're waiting for a couple of questions to be typed in, if any of the poets uh, have a a little PS to add to your presentation, feel free. Um, if you have a reading coming up or anything that you want people to know about. I, I could mention the, this um, book uh, called COVID Spring 2. Um, there is a COVID Spring 1 as well, um, pandemic poems. It's an anthology um, put together by Alex Peary, who's the New Hampshire Poet Laureate. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, it's available with Hobblebush Books. Great, thank you. Uh, Allison, do you uh, have anything to add? Do you want to uh, tell people how they can get to these? Um, to these places. Now, I want to mention that in the book, which I had to practice how to do this. Okay, here. <laughs> in, the, in the book, which it's very hard to see because of my, my virtual background, you can see this B is by um, artist Martin Bridge. And uh, Allison hand drew a map that has all the places on it, which is pretty cool. And there's also the pictures that you see behind uh, behind the poets are in the, the Upper Valley Land Trust chapter, which, oh gosh, this works so much better. And okay, here we go. <laughs> all right. There, um, that's about all I can do with that. <laughs> it's a book. Um, I think probably we don't have any questions being typed in. Uh, does anyone want to unmute and ask a question or a comment? I have a couple comments Well, if people are thinking about questions. Um, one is I want to address the name of the dismal. <laughs> That's named after um, the great dismal swamp in Virginia and um, North Carolina. So it is not, it is not a dismal place. It's a great place to visit, um, especially in the winter. It's got great trails. It's in um, East Hanover, New Hampshire. And it, uh, it was conserved by a lovely couple and then eventually um, went to the land trust. So that's a little about that. Um, up on the hill is in Charlestown, New Hampshire. It's a huge property. It's our the biggest property that we own or have conserved. It's 1,100 acres of working forest and farmland. Um, it includes our one of our food pantry gardens where we grow food that goes to um, the soup kitchen in Claremont. And um, it was generously donated to us by uh, Harvey and Christina Hill. And it's called Up on the Hill because um, that is what they used to say when they were going up to the farm there, we're going up on the hill. And their last name is Hill, so it's kind of a play on words. Um, and finally, Trues Ledges. Um, so the other two properties are owned by UVLT. Trues Ledges is owned by the city of Lebanon. 
um, but protected with a conservation easement by UVLT. And that is one of the most popular swimming holes in the Upper Valley. <laughs> so um, they're all great places to visit. You can find trail maps um, on our website. I'll put the link to that in the chat. Um, and the book is available for purchase on our website. I will also put that link in the chat. Um, so if anyone's interested in buying the book, it's a lovely book. and I'm very excited about it. I, I, just real quickly, I, I would like to thank all of the poets uh, and uh, enjoyed it very much. I've got my blaze orange jacket. I guess you could maybe you can see this that uh, I had, would advise people to use as when they go out and walk on these three properties. But um, just real quickly, it, what is, I, I noticed in the newspaper article that it, it implied that anybody can walk on any of these properties. Can you just clarify that? I mean, I did not, I live in Etna, New Hampshire and there are some in my neighborhood, so to speak, but I wasn't clear on, on what that means. Yep, all three of these properties are publicly accessible. Um, they all have public marked trails with trail maps and parking areas. Um, and so they're open to the public um, both on and I mean off trail as well, though, if you're not a seasoned hiker, I suggest staying on trails. Um, does that answer your question? I mean, uh, there's also- Yeah, and do you, on your website, places. is there, a, is there a, are there maps uh, yep. on your website? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna put the link in the chat so that people can find them. Yeah, obviously you wanna be cautious during hunting season, but I, I just was curious. I, I wasn't clear on that, thank you. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hike them. I haven't been to them. I've been to up on the hill over only a little bit part of it, but I haven't hiked it yet. So I'm looking forward to exploring them. You made them, the poetry made that all so delicious. Thank you. You should do this again next uh, or every month. We certainly have enough poets to do it. <laughs> um, I, have an, I have a question for Allison, if that's if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, you know, I live up in uh, Essex, New York, you know, um, right on Lake Champlain. One of the great mysteries of Lake Champlain is like, is there some sort of sea creature that lives inside it? They even have a name for it. It's called Champ. People are always looking for this mysterious creature. Uh, the same applies, the mystery of me trying to discover the truth of True's ledges, right? True's ledge. I mean, you go there, it's so interesting because up to now, I thought it was just True's ledge. And now I'm hearing it's True's ledges. And then there's the, the idea of the possessive True's versus T-R-U-E-S. And it's listed on their sign as like T-R-U-E-S, but then I hear it's also possessive. And it's also here, it's True's brook, like area. So, wow, there's a lot going on. And Allison, we need you to step in and kind of solve this mystery for us, I think. I'm not sure if I have a, a real <laughs> concrete answer for you. Um, I did do a little investigating because I know we talked about this when we were deciding what to call it in the book. All of UVLT's legal documents say trues with an apostrophe ledges. And I talked to um, somebody at the city and what they said is that true is the surname of early settlers in the neighborhood um, and that the name of the brook has changed over time um, from different people's names, basically. Um, but eventually the brook was called True's Brook. With an apostrophe is the correct way. But then I, it was like, you know, your, your signs don't say that. And he was just like, yeah, they're wrong. <laughs> um, so I, I believe that it is True's Ledges and True's Brook with um, the apostrophe because it was a uh, early settlers. So Thank you. that's what I'm sticking that's, with. <laughs> good, you should, right? You should stick to that. Stick to your story no matter what. Thank you. Great, so I, I think if, um, if there are no more questions or comments, I'm just going to put, um, a nice sort of ending slide up since I can't really show the book that easily. That is a picture of the front cover. <laughs> um, and uh, of course you have up on hill here, uh, which looks like a great place to visit. So 
I want to thank everyone for coming and especially thank the poets for their wonderful work on this book. And we're just really excited to have this available um, through the Land Trust to support the really important work they do protecting spaces like this. So thank you, Allison. Thank you, Upper Valley Land Trust. And thank you, poets. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. This, this was great.